Thanks, everyone. I think we're going to start now. And as usual, I'm Councillor Lucia Lesnevs, and I'm the Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And welcome to you all. And this meeting is being recorded for live and subsequent broadcast live councils and um, So welcome, everyone. Thank you. And um, we're we'll keep championing the hybrid. So let's hope it works. Um, and please, if you have any problems, go just here and do go into the chat and just drop us a line if there are any issues. Uh, so perhaps we could have just a quick round of introductions so you know who I am. And we'll start in the room here and then go online. And I've got Charlotte to my right. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from the Assistant Director of the Good afternoon, I'm Sharon Brown, Chair of Health Watch in Hungary. I'm Stephen Brabson, I'm Captain Club, and the Children of Families, the Chair of this group, and the Assistant Director of 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 the Assistant Director Hello, I'm Peter Christian. I'm a Haringey GP and one of the two clinical reps on uh, the NCL CCG representing Haringey. Thanks, Peter. And thank you, everyone. You've told me that's for us. I've been discussing with Fiona, so we do have to have some in the room and some at home. So thank you all. Um, let's move to online. Jeffrey. Uh, hello everyone, uh, Jeff Rioson, Chief Executive Bridge Renewal Trust and uh, Voluntary Sector Rep. And sorry I couldn't be in to join in the fund. Uh, thank you. Jonathan Gardner. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, just trying to come off mute. Um, I'm Jonathan Gardner. I'm Director of Strategy at Whittington Health and I'm here for Siobhan Harrington, the Chief Executive. Thank you. Richard Paula. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard Gourlay. Uh, I'm the Director of Strategic Development for North Middlesex Hospital here for Dr. Nena Asuji. Thank you. Michelle? My name is Michelle Gimrin. I'm uh, the Lead Officer, uh, Lead Commissioner for uh, Autism and Learning Disabilities. And I was just here for that one item. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Hello, I'm Rachel Lissauer. I'm the Director of Integration for Haringey Borough within North Central London CCG. You're on mute, Chair. We, we can't hear you, Chair. You're on, on mute. We can't, we can't quite hear you. You can't hear me. You can hear, hear you now. We couldn't hear you before. Oh, apologies. Oh, what happened there? Um, Deborah. I think Deborah might be unavailable, but she's joining uh, from mine. Hi. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry, Deborah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Deborah King, Mind in Haringey. I'm here on behalf of uh, Lynette Charles, CEO. Thank you. Will? Hi, I'm, I'm Will May Maris. I'm Director of Public Health in Haringey. Just, just to note, when you were doing the intros in the room, I found it quite hard to hear Councillor Brabazon and Anne uh, it, Graham. It may be because they're furthest away from the, the front. So just if anyone else noticed that during the meeting, we'll, we'll highlight. And, and if Anne and Councillor Brabazon uh, would need to need to speak speak out extra clearly, they're very clear speakers. Thank you. So, um, everyone that that's in, project, please. Yeah, Deb will shout at me. Could we say that we can't hear them too well either? <laughs> okay, everyone needs to project. All right. We'll shout. Shout at me, fine. I think <coughs> if it feels unusual, it's probably right. We can hear it. It's probably the answer that. And I think I've done. Oh, Sarah, apologies. Sarah. Sarah on the <coughs> Yeah, hi. Sarah McDonald Davis. I'm the exec director uh, across our five boroughs at NCLCCJ. Thank you. Thank you very much. I haven't missed anything, anyone, I hope. There might be some people joining later, but they will introduce themselves when they are here. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, so, do you have any apologies? 
Uh, yes, we've had apologies from Dr. John Rohan, David Archibald, Lynette Charles, and Joe Spotch. Thank you. Um, and Beverly Targ. Thank you. Uh, urgent business? No urgent business, Chair. Declarations of interest. Okay. Uh, questions, deputations, petitions, Fiona? None received, Chair. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to item seven, the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, are we happy there a correct record? Are there any, any changes, amendments that we need? Richard. Chair, if I might ask for a an amendment on page six, where I'm reported about the opening hours of the urgent care centre. Um, what I should read is there is an urgent care centre available at North Middlesex Hospital seven days a week that is staffed by both general practitioners and emergency nurse practitioners. The hours of opening are incorrect there, but if we could just record it um, as that, I've sent a, a suggestion to Fiona for, for the record. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Um, and so wait, are we happy that those are a, a correct record other than that change? Yes, thank you. Um, and I see that Councillor Hakart has joined us. Welcome. OK, moving on to the next item, COVID-19 and vaccines update. Is this you, Will? Yes, that's that's right. So it's an uh, item introduced by me, uh, Will, as Director of Public Health in Haringey. What I'm going to do is quite a brief update, uh, noting the uh, uh, meaty agenda that we have. Um, just going to briefly talk about the current case rates for COVID in the borough. Uh, then some updates on the vaccination programme and particularly sort of new developments uh, in the vaccination programme and, and would welcome after my um, update uh, any NHS colleagues from the trust or CCG to chip in anything uh, additional from their perspectives. So I'm just going to share something on my screen so just have to bear with me while that uh, comes up. That's going to be uh, looking at the um, the uh, case rates first. I'll just put that on the slideshow. And you should be able to see uh, a kind of a, a graph with lots of different blue lines. And the numbers on the side are quite small, but I'll try and uh, kind of take you through it. So we've we, we've got a first, this is the daily confirmed COVID cases in Haringey. We've got a big peak in December and January uh, past where we were seeing an average of around 400 cases of COVID per day. Then we had a quiet period as we came out of uh, lockdown and the vaccination program took hold. And then as we went into uh, May and June, we had an acceleration of cases driven by the Delta variant and us coming out of lockdown. That peaked, we had a kind of a, a, a third peak uh, just around the end of this last school term, so mid July, where we were seeing nearly 200 cases of COVID per day, but thankfully not the impact on hospitalizations and deaths we'd seen in December and January. And then since then, there's been a, a, a actually a gradual decline uh, in case rates in the borough, and that's not something that's been seen across the country. We may in the next few weeks, um, as universities go back, see an increase uh, in, in case rates. Our case rates uh, around the London average, and London is actually one of the regions in the country which has the lowest um, COVID cases at the moment. Uh, moving on, um, the next slide shows the, the weekly number of COVID deaths in, in Haringey. Uh, and you can see this shows actually the first wave on the left hand side of the screen in April, May of last year. Then the second wave um, uh, in uh, January and February, where we saw significant uh, numbers of deaths from COVID in Haringey, over 500 in total in those two waves. And then since then, we've seen very few deaths really from COVID. We've seen a slight uptick. uptick uh, and with a small numbers of COVID related deaths uh, since the start of the summer holidays, which has um, coincided with that, that increase in cases driven by the Delta variant. So of course this is concerning that we're still seeing deaths in Haringey, but we are seeing uh, much fewer than we have in previous waves, which is a, a sign of the impact of the vaccination programme. Our hospitals um, still have moderate numbers of patients with COVID uh, in them and it's uh, in the Whittington, I think the numbers have fallen in the last couple of weeks. We've just got just over 20 patients with COVID. In North Mid, there are around 50 patients with, with COVID uh, uh, at the moment, and that's that's stable. Um, but compared to the numbers of patients in hospital, 
over the winter, it's, it's significantly less, again, showing the impact of the vaccination program. Um, however, of, of concern, um, and we don't have sort of um, uh, quantitative data to show this, is reports from both of those hospitals that people who are in intensive care uh, are often relatively young now, under 50, and often, under vaccin uh, often unvaccinated as well, um, which really emphasises the importance of our vaccination message. I'm going to move on to vaccination. So this next slide is a London comparator for people over 50 who've had two COVID jabs, and this is the proportion of people in the population. And we're just uh, just under 75% in Haringey, and you can see with that with the eighth lowest in London. Um, but actually, we are the fourth most deprived uh, borough in London. So our, our compared to our sort of usual comparators on vaccination programs like Newham and Hackney with similar populations, we're doing very similar to them, if not slightly better and significantly better comparatively than we have on previous vaccination programs. Having said that, and you'll see in the next slide, this is the uptake of COVID vaccination by age group in Haringey, and the key column is the one on the extreme right. You can see that while in older age groups, and this applies to really, really generally across the board to all ethnic groups, so sort of the over 65s have got really good uptake of the COVID vaccination, particularly bearing in mind our, our usual uptake of vaccination programmes for adults in, in, in Haringey. But as you go down the younger age groups, that falls off quite dramatically. And actually, that's what we're seeing across, across London. Um, we've recently rolled out vaccinations to 16, 17 year olds, and we, I think, the uptakes increased since then, but we're still not quite up at the 40% level of uptake. So quite a low level of uptake in young people. And then for all age groups, if you look at the uptake over time, it, it, we've, re, we've really hit a plateau in all of the age groups. So we've done so much work and I described a lot of that work in the last Health and Wellbeing Board. And again, this is the picture we're seeing across London, that we've been really proactive in spreading the message, giving information, giving opportunities to people to get vaccinated in the community. And we've kind of re we've reached a, a limit really in these different population groups. OK, I'm going to stop stop sharing now. Um, the last slide is just is on ethnic disparities, which we've talked about before. There are still some really stark ethnic disparities. If you look at the all age population, particularly amongst white other uh, black Caribbean uh, uh, groups. Um, but if you look in the older people who are the most vulnerable, uh, these gaps are, are much less stark and we've achieved really good uptake uh, across uh, all our major ethnic groups in Haringey. Then I just wanted to talk very briefly about two important developments in the vaccination programme. So the first one is the vaccination of uh, secondary school age children 12 to 15. So you will have heard in the news that this has been recommended as an offer to all 12 to 15 year olds and that offer is through schools uh, and that's something that offer is one we support uh, in terms of uh, benefits of protecting clinically vulnerable people in our community but also importantly preventing disruption in schools and disruption to the education of children and young people that rollout will be beginning uh, in the next um, fortnight or so and our, our local schools um, the vaccination provider through our local schools will be writing to uh, parents to gain consent for that for that program. The other significant development is the booster program for the core COVID vaccination program, which will mean an offer of a third COVID vaccine for people who are over 50 and in clinically vulnerable groups. And that rollout will is beginning. People already have access um, through walk in provision in primary care centres. But of importance, the third jab should be given no sooner than six months after the second jab. So only a, only a minority of people who are eligible for the third jab are able to get it now and the rollout will continue over winter alongside significantly the flu vaccination programme. So I think that's that's all I wanted to say in terms of key updates. Of course, we're doing lots of work continuing to engage on both the COVID vaccination and we'll begin with that, that process with the flu vaccination programme uh, as well. Thanks, Will. That's really useful. And that, I will take a few questions, but what I'm going to suggest is if we have anything that's quite a lot of detail around particularly what we're doing. I know we're doing a lot of work around um, preparing for the young people's vaccinations, but also continuing in our efforts. I'd suggest that we then have follow up with um, email by email just so that we can cover everything we need to in the agenda. But um, I'll take a few questions if anyone has some. Okay, I saw Peter first and then Sharon. 
it's, it's not so much a question, um, but uh, just a, an observation, really. And it is it is very gratifying to see the figures, as well as pointed out, and the uh, the effect that the vaccination program has had. But it's also worth pointing out that the people who are in hospital in ICU, and as Will has said, will probably be mostly unvaccinated, are still taking up precious ICU beds, which is inhibiting the recovery plans in our trust in terms of getting people into hospital for quite substantial operations where you need the ICU backup. So it, it is still a bit of a problem that hasn't yet disappeared on that front. The other observation is that the, uh, the booster program will mean that that will still tie up uh, it, some very essential staff during the autumn season um, in terms of having to maintain the vaccination program when possibly maybe we could be hoping to be stepping it all down. And so that will have implications in terms of primary care and the workforce and the people who are still required to uh, uh, run the vaccination clinics. Thanks, Peter. I think there's a, a really important point. So thank you for making them. And I might come back in case anyone else wants to take Shannon. Yeah, uh, two questions really. I think, uh, first of all, in terms of the booster programme, I think what um, recipients or potential recipients want to know is how that's going to work. Will people be summoned? or do they need to present themselves? I think that's the question patients would be asking. And secondly, I think there is a concern amongst patients about the flu jab program, um, both about um, the arrangements for it, the capacity for it, and indeed about the, the supply of it. Um, one picks up that there may be a shortage, and clearly, um, at Peter's point, there is the whole issue of the capacity, certainly of general practice, to be able to deliver the flu program. And it's concerned that we could be into a nasty one, I think, this winter, because of lack of exposure, as I understand it, um, in the previous 12 months. Is that right? The it's experts true. will tell me, I'm sure. So I think there is some anxiety among patients about both of those issues. Thank you, Sharon. Some very important points there. Does, um, does anyone want to come in on, on any of those? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to come back. Um, I'll come back on the, um, the, the, just the, how the people will be invited. So as I mentioned, it's six months um, post their second jab. And we're, we're, we're well placed in Harringay in terms of provision for the COVID boosters through pharmacies and through the primary care sites that we've got in place as well. And uh, th there will be an invite system which will which will be put put in place. But of course, like we have previously, we'll be doing outreach work. We'll be doing proactive work in the community to spread the word and make sure people are not missed. Um, flu, um, the the delivery model is slightly different in that it's it's as it always has been for flu, which is mainly through people's own GPs and also a number of pharmacies. And I know a number of pharmacies have already got the flu. Um, flu vaccine in place and we'll we'll be having a real focus on delivery of flu alongside the COVID vaccination to try and increase numbers so all of those risks that Sharon has rightly highlighted in terms of primary care capacity in terms of supply chain issues that we're seeing not just with um we don't I, I'm not sure if there are any ones for, for flu but we know that's an issue in terms of things being transported from different countries and around the country but that we're we're actively keeping an eye on those things locally thank okay, you Will Sharon's got a so we'll just come back very briefly on that. We've, we've done some research amongst uh, patients about um, whether or not um, they would like to have both vaccines at the same time. And the clear message from patients is that they don't. They don't want to have both on the same day. So um, just passing that on, if it could be avoided, I think. Um, it's, it's Sharon, I think. Um, not necessarily for purely for that reason, but it's glad to have that good to have that patient feedback. It's, it's very unlikely that there'll be um, a dual delivery of COVID and flu vaccinations, apart from potentially in care homes. That that's my understanding there. So it will be set. They will be delivered separately. So that that happens to chime with the kind of patient preference as well, which is positive. Um, I think that's really useful, Sharon. And if there is something uh, from that piece of research that you'd like to circulate. 
if between us all, I think that would be really useful and interesting. So thank you. And before I can, I can see Jeffrey's got his hand up, but before I just wanted to, Rachel, I wondered if you wanted to come in and just say on your perception of our ability to cope locally and capacity, given both Sharon and Peter's comments. So thank you very much. Um, I was I was really interested and I think, you know, Sharon, it's really helpful that you bring those concerns to the board. I mean, what what I think um, the GPs have been really keen to emphasise is that flu jabs is is their bread and butter. That is what they do. And they will follow all the same mechanisms that they usually follow to invite their patients in for flu jabs. And they have actually been reporting that people are more inclined to take up flu jabs this year. Um, I think that that public messaging around um, people's slightly lower immunity to usual um, winter viruses has meant that um, that, that people um, are coming forward. So just to provide some reassurance that it very much is being seen by GPs as part of their business as usual, core to what they do, very keen to still be the ones who, who do it. It's a useful opportunity for them to um, to, to see their patients actually. Um, so whilst there are many understandable concerns about primary care capacity at the moment, I'm not receiving messages and I, uh, maybe Peter will kind of come on in on this, but I'm re not receiving messages that that puts the flu vaccination um, campaign in, in, in any risk at all. Um, I, I'm like you, Rachel. No, I haven't picked anything up, but I was merely pointing out that there is, you know, only a finite capacity. And yes, you know, practices will adopt their usual practice in terms of doing it. You know, but I think the public has to understand that, you know, that there is only a finite capacity for the workforce. And so they will have to try and do business as usual while trying to catch up with this enormous backlog from the pandemic. Thanks, Peter. It's useful. And we always have to bear in mind those ratios of number of GPs per hundred population. Uh, it's a big factor, isn't it, really? Uh, Jeffrey has waited patiently, and then I can see Richard also come in. Take Jeffrey first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think. So my question has probably been answered slightly, but I want a kind of builds on what Sharon was saying there as well, which is uh, on the booster. Um, and I think is whether, you know, the role that encouragement or active encouragement might play, because I think we come across two groups of people, really, those who have done it the first couple of times now, and, you know, there's no problem. So I think they're quite happy to come back. But there are those who it was a push really to get this done and then to let ask them to come back again. So we need uh, so things like targeted uh, engagement um, is going to be really important as well. Uh, and obviously this is part of it is not necessarily a question uh, uh, well, but you know, it's good that, for example, initiatives like the community protect is being um, uh, extended to allow some of this work with you know particular communities that you mentioned where the take up is quite low. So I just want to commend uh, public health and everyone I think to try and keep up that targeted work on that. Uh, and my other final thing is really with young people it remains a bit of a challenge. Um, I think there was some mixed messaging from government around passports and so forth. Is that still is you know is that gone or is that potentially on the cards? Thank you. Thanks, so, thanks, Jeffrey, and for your uh, comments around engagement. Of course, we're continuing to work with you and others on that. So thank you for your support as well. Uh, on the passports, it has been um, a lack of clarity from uh, government. They were on the table, then they were off the table. They're now kind of off the table in terms of, you know, showing vaccine certification to go to events. But it's, it's part of the government's plan B uh, measures if um, uh, pressure on the NHS gets too high, case rates get too high, that they'll be back on the table again. But yes, it's a mixed, it's not a, the clearest of pictures. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Thank you. I, I just come, want to come back on uh, Peter's point around capacity. So um, at the moment, we've got 45 patients uh, in the North Mid with uh, who are COVID positive, of which seven are in uh, critical care. So that's about a third of our capacity um, with uh, COVID positive uh, patients. An absolute 
imperative for us is to get our elective program back so our planned care so planned operations um uh, re-establishing that uh, and uh, and clearing um, and starting to work through the backlog of patients that, that we've got and that we need to uh, we want to and, and really need to get on and, and, and treat um, there is mutual aid um, across the across the system, so there is some transfer of patients between services between uh, providers to try and keep that uh, critical care capacity available because that really isn't important in terms of um, the planned care. I guess my only other point would be around our workforce as well. So 24% of our absences currently are due to uh, of our staff absences are, are due to COVID, um, and that's a, clearly an important as aspect for us in terms of kind of having a sustainable workforce going into the winter uh, which we know is going to be uh, challenging and, and difficult so um, again it's just kind of reinforcing that message about the imperative of vaccination it is uh, the majority of patients that we're seeing um, in a critical care are unvaccinated um, so the more that people can that we can pick up the vaccination program um, and uh, and spread it across the, our local population the, the the better it's going to be for providers Thank you, Richard. That's really useful. And um, you almost asked, answered the question that I was going to ask, which is of those 45, do you have a sense how many of them are va unvaccinated? I can't tell you out of the 45, but out of the seven in critical care, um, I would uh, I would suspect virtually all of them are unvaccinated. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan. Um, just to say from Whittington, almost exactly the same story as as North Middlesex, really pressured on ITU still. Um, we have a small ITU, as everybody knows, and we currently have six COVID patients with three non-COVID patients in there. Um, so we are nearly full on a regular basis, and that is a, a quite a stressful situation for our staff. And it's been going on for so long that they're, they're really um, exhausted. So I think ITU is the main pressure. We actually, um, Will's, Will's numbers are just a few days uh, late, as, which is uh, to be expected. Um, uh, they, we only have uh, 12 patients at the moment in the rest of the wards um, that uh, are COVID positive, which is a good story, but absolutely the same story about ITU being the pressure point, but also the, the worrying point from a, a, a vaccination point of view. Thank you. Um, and I hesitate to move us on, but I think we need to because there's a lot on the agenda. Um, and, and we'll revisit obviously this is a standing item. Uh, and please also do, I do encourage you to get in between times if there are specific issues, especially on what we're doing around vaccination and what we can do more. They will probably agree. I, good ideas are always welcome. Um, so thank you. Uh, moving on to item nine, and to Charlotte and Jeffrey, the update on our work to tackle racism and inequalities. Thank you, Chair. Um, hopefully, we can see on the screen as well the slide deck. Thank you. Um, so, Jeffrey and I, I'll, I'll run through the slides, and then Jeffrey will um, add some thoughts at the end, and then we'll have to take any questions at the end. So um, this, as you'll be aware, is the um, a regular update we provide to each meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board on the nine point action plan that's developed to join the voluntary community sector organisations. It covers nine key areas and the action plan is drawn up after discussions across the sector. Um, this time round, we have sort of not added to the actions from last time, but just focused on new actions. So it's, you know, some of these slides are slightly thinner than they might have been previously, but I think we could, we could just sort of um, focus on, on the areas where we've been working fresh and making, making some additional progress. Um, just a reminder that um, by way of background, we have a partnership programme plan addressing racism and racial discrimination, which we've been through joint meetings of the House and our being the Community Safety Partnership. We're aiming to hold a meeting, a joint meeting, by the end of the calendar year, and we're aiming to defend that. So, on the nine point action plan, our first point is around data and evidence. I think this is really, um, really pleased with progress and with the support of our policy team, with colleagues in the CCG, um, to try and um, develop new categorizations for ethnic monitoring that pick up um, nationality, language, and ethnicity. They echo and align with the data that ONS, um, so the Office for National Statistics, is capturing. 
We are talking with other partners beyond the NHS about use of new categories. I'm pleased to say we're starting to use the data already at a meeting of the um, early years review, for example, in the, in the council, we began to break down some of the data that we had on attainment in early years by the new categorization. So it's really good to see that in action. Um, the second area is around building resilience and trying to make sure that core and project funding gets out across organisations, including black and Asian and white ethnic organisations in the borough. Um, so a note that we had successful bids to the MCL North Central London Transition Inequalities Fund, um, taking over a million pounds, a number of those are going through to grassroots organisations. We're at the moment working up the priorities and approach to the next round of inequalities funding. Um, there's a meeting with the UCS forum where this was um, discussion has begun, and I think we're really keen to take that forward in a, in a co-designed way so that we do get the input from their organisations into what the priority should be. Um, and we had a further meeting with the Turkish and Kurdish Network yesterday, which is becoming more strongly established, and our next meeting is going to focus specifically on how do we um, create greater sustainability for um, organisations focusing in the focus on supporting um, Turkish and Kurdish residents. The third area is around movement and mental health. Really just an update on the Great Mental Health Programme, which has been running since July. Um, so it's a short-term project, and that's why it's running because it's only 12 months and there's seven projects. So the idea is that this really does focus on leverage engagement across the borough, um, helps us develop the community mental health champions, builds on the place-based community navigators we already have in place, and tries to get um, stronger bits of Sure well, there is around domestic violence. I wanted to point particularly to the fact that we had over 1,700 responses to our safety opinion at night survey, um, which highlighted how we feel about safety outside the home. We're yet to analyse that data fully, but I think it's fair to say that domestic violence and violence rewarding of women girls is a key area of focus, and particularly how that affects. Um, the next area is around communication and awareness raising. We've already heard about the use of the importance of community protect with the vaccination program. Again, at the Turkish and Kurdish Network yesterday, there was a real strong support for the in that community and what a difference they've made. And um, you know, people are saying what, what a really helpful addition it is to resources have someone who is knowledgeable about the health systems but also can, can speak and communicate the language in, in directly in community languages but also um, to have the residents and some trusted voice. Um, we, I want to take the opportunity to say that um, the web pages for Black History Month are now live on the Karen Gay Council's website um, and that adds to our sort of Bank of Resources in Black History, having a 365, which is a, a bank of resources across a whole range of areas um, on the web, constantly updated, and a really good source, well used by local residents. Um, if you have ideas about how it could be improved, please do let us know. And we are developing an anti discrimination campaign to raise awareness of the impact of discrimination on residents and to celebrate. The sixth area is a sixth area is around support to cohorts of families and communities. Um, and here just ensuring that we recall that that sort of resilience piece, we are anxious about the effects of the end of furlough and the um, non-continuation of the uplift to universal credit, which is currently still um, in, in the plans um, on our local residents, so doing quite a lot of work response to what those impacts are likely to mean for local residents and particularly affected by those pressures. The seventh on shielding, so we now have a formal halting of the shielding programme by the Department of Health and Social Care, that communication came out earlier this week. However, as we've heard from um, Dr. Morales and from colleagues, the importance of COVID and pre vaccination for school communities remains a really, really strong um, way to protect and um, those most vulnerable in the community. The eighth is around equitable access to services. Um, so again, we're really relying mostly on our um, use of data and our food to use more granular data to support equity of access. Um, 
it would be worth just focusing on an early role in use that which was in our recent deep dive into the partnership program plan on exclusions and attainment, which really tried to drill down into some of the um, circumstances and to use data to understand what difference um, we can make by understanding the issues better. And finally, on digital exclusion, um, it's fair to say this is a, an issue which has got a really strong, um, strong resonance with us all um, as we move forward to next steps. We're still using digital as we are in this meeting in a whole range of settings um, and the importance of ensuring that it is as effective as possible in the main. So um, digital inclusion, for example, is a key um, underpinning factor to support um, our local refugee and asylum seeker households. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's becoming increasingly important across our strategies. And um, I'm sure Jeffrey will update us on the Lee Valley Primary School pilot, which is continuing to reap benefits in terms of homework, um, attendance, um, and support to our future. So I'm going to leave it there, Chair. Um, that's a quick counter to what I appreciate. Um, but I think it's fair to say we've continued to work on, on a number of fronts. I think. Um, the benefits of, of really seeing some of the community champions active locally. This has been really good to see and beginning to, to show some. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, for that. Uh, really helpful. As you can see, there's there are lots of things happening to kind of implement the plan. I just wanted to add to what Charlotte said, picking up with the digital. Uh, exclusion or inclusion there. Um, the work on the Lake Valley, which is meant to be a pilot, is going really well. Uh, we've now gone beyond giving the devices and uh, and uh, making sure there's access and you know, the kids are doing their homework, which is now up to about 98% from around, you know, less than 10% in terms of participation. Uh, we are beginning to move to the wider determinants of that now, why they are in the position they are and why perhaps they are suffering the exclusion that they are and beginning to deal with some of those issues, not least around you know, uh, motivational and aspiration and role models. And we've got people from the sector working with parents and with the young people as well to uh, sort of with the children as well to try and you know, improve that um, culture of family learning and involvement. Um, there's also something around digital interns as well, actually, which is now we're also working and these digital interns are employed within BAME organizations. Again, working with the communities there to uh, see how support and digital um, barriers to digital uh, access can be addressed. Um, and lastly, I just want to comment on the, uh, the funding. Uh, I think it's really important that this change is driven by some funding and the NHS Inequalities Fund is adding uh, potentially uh, quite a bit in terms of um, empowering community groups. As Charlotte said, we had a, uh, our council and CCG colleagues at the um, at the voluntary sector forum uh, last week, whereby we kind of went through how that phase two could look like some of the thematic areas that would of, of intervention, and lastly, the kind of mechanism that would allow at a locality level for funding to be resourced to some of these grassroots organizations as well. So we're kind of working on that model with uh, our all our partners. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I had, um, this is Sharon, but I'm just gonna, I had a couple of things I wanted to share and then I'll come in with Sharon. Um, uh, actually, one was an observation having attended the VCS forum, uh, but I wanted to share, which is, I very much reflected on the fact that the language that we use in describing the things that we want to tackle really affects the answers and how we find answers and what answers we find. Um, and I thought that was quite a strong message that came out of that forum. Um, hopefully you'd agree, Geoffrey. So strongly on my mind, and I just want to share that with everyone. Um, I wanted to ask about the anti-discrimination campaign and how we're working with, how we're integrating community those with lived expertise and the VCS sector. Um, and I also wondered that now that we're talking about the end of the shielding programme, what that means for how we support clinically vulnerable people who uh, still will be very concerned about being out in the community, being at events, 
and also about their own exposure, um, if they have family, if they have children, etc. So I wonder if those are things we could address. And maybe Sharon, we could add your question and then everyone will be as well. Um, I was really baffled um, on the comments on digital access and the importance of um, improving people's ability to digitally uh, interact with health and social care. Um, at at uh, Health Watch Hangar, we, we're working with NCL on I think, an important project to provide help to people that, that don't have those skills. But there does seem to be a sticking point um, in that um, GPs are not referring people to us for the help that they need. So this is really just to flag up to all involved in the system that there is help available uh, two patients that are going to have difficulty either using e-consult or um, having appointments with consultants that we can help with that, uh, but uh, they do need to be heard. We don't automatically know who they are, these people. So it is a question of encouraging those referrals to help the survey. Thank you, Sharon. That's really useful. Um, uh, does, someone, does anyone want to come in on that? <laughs> yes, I mean, I think, um, I, I mean, my first thought, Sharon, is we can get it mentioned at the weekly GP webinar, uh, which Joe Sovarch chairs. Now, I know that's across the whole of uh, NCL, not just Harringay, but that's a great way of getting to all the 200 practices and getting the message out. Has it not been mentioned? Uh, I don't know. I try and plug in every week, but, uh, but, but I can always check if it hasn't. Sometimes it needs mentioning more than once. So Let's see how it's funding it. So, mm. <laughs> um, not, places you say, we can see if we can, yeah, we can uh, yeah. do it again, which is good, I think. It's not so much the GPs themselves, it's their staff, of course, who often will know who, who are the people who need help. So, I think, I think that's the message is that maybe, maybe they have heard about it, maybe they haven't, um, but maybe there are things that we could do more. And maybe, you wouldn't mind taking that away from having a think about what that might look like and we can pick up. I'm sure we've well. circulated all practices, but obviously we're well aware that there are huge pressures on you and it may be one email amongst several hundred that comes in. Yeah. I think it'd be good to, to understand what, um, sure. and if there are any other mechanisms as well that we can bring over because it's been sounds like really important and great work that you're doing, but a shame if lots of people can't access it. Um, if you pick up my two questions and then I'll be in the party. Thank you. Um, and just on that, it is there, it's operated from the library, so it's nice and accessible. Um, so just to try to learn everything here. Um, I cancelled that once we, we talked a bit and talked to you about the e-how language effects and um, seeing issues. I think it is really, really incumbent on us all to think about that because it does sort of shape how we think how it's going to form. I mean, I know I've mentioned the Turkish and Kurdish network a little bit, but yesterday we had a meeting which was focusing on citizens' violence, and actually by talking in a particular language, it affected perceptions of the issues. And then when we looked at the data, there was actually a, there were other stories to be told from the data. So it was really interesting how it sort of played through people's understanding, I and mean, it was actually a really learning process, the whole network meeting that we saw. The second point was on the anti discrimination campaign. So it's in early stages, but it's got two problems with it. One is we're working with my sorts on particularly on sort of capturing stories of people's experience of how intersectionality affects them and how people's perceptions from what they see um, can really um, be negative around uh, making assumptions and driving discrimination. So it's a story based approach, which is trying to sort of understand and get a really positive picture, but also um, address experience um, from an identity basis, if I can put it like that. Um, and then the second strand is a sort of really um, anxious sort of do you know how it feels sort of campaign around anti discrimination and what some of the things you can do. You observe discrimination in practice, what some of the things you can say, what some of the routes, when do you when do you to get in touch with the police to identify as hate crime? So really trying to understand how local residents and us all can sort of be part of an anti-discriminatory approach. So it's got two problems to it, um, and it but it is only stages, so maybe it takes five. And um, then in terms of the end of the shielding program, and Rachel and I have discussed this before because it was a really good um 
sort of piece of work across organisations to work to share data and understand how we respond. And we have to look at how does this become the kind of what we sort of most want to protect going forward. And Rachel, do you want to come in? Because I'm not sure we've got a definitive answer at this point, but it was just that we're mindful that we want to build on the shared work rather than sort of lose it in the next step. I, I, it was a bit sort of cussing out that bit um, with the shielded population. I think what was really what was really helpful was the way that um, through COVID we were able to triangulate sets of information um, about who our most vulnerable um, families, households, individuals were. And it was a combination of those who'd been identified clinically through that um, shielding process those who were in contact with connected communities and um, those who were self-identifying, those who GPs were aware of. And so I think I'm particularly interested as we as we move forward and think about how do we support the most vulnerable within our wards of highest deprivation? Are there ways that we can um, work collectively like a, a, a team around those um, those households and those individuals? building on the fact that we know we we did it um, for the shielded and vulnerable cohort during during COVID. Um, so that's something that we're going to ask our our neighbourhoods, our localities, which is essentially our groups of GPs working with um, the teams, the community health and the community mental health teams on the ground within their neighbourhoods to just to just have in mind to think about that um, coming together and sharing our information about about the people who need access to um, to support and to professional advice. Thank you, Rachel. I've got lots of hands up and I think some of you might be responding. Um, Charlotte, you no. Oh, no apologies, I'm misreading. Apologies, everyone. Captain Hikata. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, there was one element that just sort of stood out for me because the Cabinet had met um, with individuals, groups, organisations like Harangay Welcome in relation to refugees, migrants. Um, and we discussed the, the Council's admirable welcome strategy. It's, um, it's um, statement of intent and actions in that regard. And I noticed that in this, in this, uh, in your little presentation, you did have a, a mention on um, um, the focus on refugee and asylum seeker households in relation to digital inclusion. And I just wondered, because there are sort of perhaps. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, many specific and idiosyncratic needs of that particular cohort um, beyond obviously just the digital inclusion, whether the, how they can sort of be figured in, the, in that framework, if there is a sort of more work that needs to be done there. Yeah. So, thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, yeah, as the welcome strategy covers a whole raft of areas, so priorities, and I think it's right to say that the refugee and asylum seeker households who come into the BOA to a number of groups um, need that need that broader support. I think what is really marked at the moment is that the support we're able to directly offer when when households come in under a particular resettlement scheme, so for example, the Afghan Relocation and Assistance Programme or the Afghan Resettlement um, Resettlement. Um, scheme. Um, so we can give more random support over a longer period of time and guarantees they've been offered indefinitely to remain. So there are some, some benefits that those communities um, can be through terribly traumatic times and, and you know it's, it's a small benefit that they've got some benefits when they come but other migrant patterns won't do that. So I think we've been working through the work and we've got advisory just how to improve our offer more broadly so that it's not the, the designated numbers who happen to be under particular, in this case, home office um, designated scheme, but other schemes um, are in the wider country from a whole raft of groups. Um, and we know, for example, that residents are so insensitive in the bar who are staying in their local hotel and placed by the home office, so what's our support into those houses? And you're exactly right, it's not limited to digital exclusion. Um, primary care registration is actually absolutely key. And, that we can people up with that straight away. 
early years provision, access to school provision, access to funding, which things like to be uniforms and issues like that. So there's quite a lot that they're trying to draw in there. <laughs> And just, I guess, as reassurance, is that a joint up approach? You mentioned that it's not, it's not a siloed approach, there is a sort of joint up. Yeah, so um, that is our aim. We have a lot of advisory board, which is a partnership board, so it's across council, NHS, local community sector organisations. Um, homes for homeways, and we have to try to make it as appeared um, as, as we can. Um, I think um, colleague of, uh, in Rachel's team um, actually highlighted that we're doing very well on GP legislation, for example, for refugee and migrant households in Harringay. So I think we're, we're doing a lot to be quite a good in that way. And there's always more to do, and we're trying to work on the COVID action plan to other things. Hey, um, thanks, Lauren. Uh, I think it's an important point well made because it was an important message that came out of that session with Karen. It was around the kind of nature of how people's experience, what people's experience when they arrive, and the potential for confusion and the potential for additional trauma to people when they go through some of the systems and processes that we have and that we're familiar with. Uh, thank you. I guess I wanted a bit of reassurance, Charlotte, that the punchy anti discrimination campaign. Um, which sounds really strong on allyship, and that's great to be commended. But that it will be the messaging will be informed by people who had lived expertise. Yes. I think, yeah, you know, yeah. you know why I'm, I'm saying yes, this. No, absolutely, it, it, it will be. It's, it's not something that um, a corner of um, a corner of the council has jumped up to be wrong. Be sharing it. It's this this is come out of you know people wanting us to work together and to be more proactive stance on anti-discrimination discrimination practice. So that's what's come Thank you. We look forward to seeing that. And I feel like I should fulfill Councillor Brampton's role because she's not here. Celebrate the fact that we're delivering digital inclusion through libraries. That's excellent. I think she'd be really pleased if she were here. Uh, now, uh, let's move on to item 10 the autism strategy. Uh, Catherine, we've got Catherine. And Georgie, we have Georgie yeah. as well. Thank Hi. You. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry. <laughs> so we're just going to bring up some slides for you um, on the screen. Um, I know you've been sent the strategy and sort of a background paper in advance. And Georgie and I are just going to spend 10 to 15 minutes just now talking through that and then we'll have an opportunity for question and answers afterwards. Um, so we'll just introduce ourselves to the group. So I'm Catherine Collin. I'm currently the um, Assistant Director for Complex Individualised Commissioning in the CCG, but I'm here with my old hat on really. Um, I used to be the Head of Children's Commissioning in Harringay and I work really closely with my colleague Georgie on the strategy. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Georgie jones Conahan. I'm now the Assistant Director of um, Learning Disability and Autism for the Complex Individualised Commissioning team in the CCG, but I also used to be the, uh, the Lead Commissioner in Harringay for Adult Learning Disability and Autism. So we're, we're, we're sort of wearing both our hats today because this is still something that we're, we're very interested in, uh, in in our new roles. So we're going to just talk a little bit about some of the context in terms of the autism strategy. This might be a slide where we spend a little bit more time because we think it's really important to understand where we're coming from both in terms of the need for it locally but also um, the, the kind of culture that and the tone of how the strategy is written which I think is something which is quite innovative. Um, we were really really central to the strategy is the lived experience of our autistic people and their families. We spent quite a long time really about two years doing some listening um, and, and finding out how those experiences are. We know that there are you know, NHS autism strategies and social care autism strategies, but actually we wanted to put the autistic young person or child or, or adult in the centre and think about all of the services and all of the different um, sort of areas of life that they might come up against where they might they might have some challenges um, and, and really think about how we can take that sort of very broad scope, quite an ambitious scope and put that in a strategy. Um, hence, this is a 10 year strategy because we know that there's an awful lot of different areas that it covers. Um, 
we really were very um, full of, there was great intent about the fact that this is a neurodiverse strategy. It's wanting to move away from a medical model of autism being a disorder or a deficit. It's certainly thinking about it in that positive way of it being different. And I think, no, you know, we're better than Haringey in terms of really embracing that diversity and leading the way on that. Um, and again, that was very much kind of coming from autistic people who felt that, that the sort of medical model of autism is, is you know, is, is actually unhelpful. Um, there has been a recent national NHS autism strategy. It was, we were waiting for it to be published. I mean, it's come out, it's, it's okay. It's probably just writing down things that already existed. It's a little bit toothless. And again, it's very much that medicalized model. It doesn't look holistically around the experience of autistic people, um, but it's kind of helpful to have it there in, in, in the background, but we've definitely gone further. I would say within the strategy. Um, there are a range of policy and legislative drivers in Haringey that I would say that not all areas are entirely compliant. We know again from autistic adults particularly telling us that they don't feel they have the same access to some health services and mental health services that people who, without autism might have um, and that's something you know that, that this, or this strategy is trying to address and, and, and we'll need to, to take some strides in to have equal access and equal outcomes for autistic re residents. Um, the Transforming Care Programme, that might be a bit of jargon, but it was a, a huge programme that's come out of Winterbourne view of, of the overuse of psychiatric um, and hospitals for people who are autistic and or learning disabled um, and, 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 and trying to ensure that they didn't end up in hospital unnecessarily, but actually their support needs could be met in the community. And um, I think as a sort of result of that, we've done really well in Haringey, but we do need to have more of a community offer in terms of that early intervention and prevention, particularly around those who maybe have very complex needs to stop them getting into crisis. So it's a bit more of a health, a health kind of driver. Um, there's been a ver various number of, of different kind of needs assessments. Um, which has picked up the need for autistic people in, in Haringey. So there's, I've written here the Autism Needs Assessment of 2017. There was the recent um, SEND, Special Educational Needs and Disability, JSNA, that was done in 2020, and they really showed the kind of key challenges um, for Haringey and, and the growing prevalence of, in terms of autism need, uh, autism diagnosis, etc. Um, there is the uh, sort of it's, it's every two years there's an annual self-evaluation um, sort of statement that every local authority needs to uh, needs to complete under the Autism Act kind of covering lots of different key domains and again that was an area that, that showed there needs to be quite a lot of improvement particularly for adults in Haringey. Um, I'm going to hand over to you Catherine because I think number eight to eleven are, are more children's focused. Yeah. So in terms of transitions, we've, we've heard from um, our young people and their parents, carers, that there's this awful cliff edge for many service users at 18, particularly if you have autism without a learning disability. The pathways for learning disability are much clearer. Um, we've tried to overcome this um, on an individual basis with some commissioning innovation. So we've been trying to use personal budgets, but um, Part of this strategy really is about trying to extend that offer so it's more consistent um, and it doesn't just focus on those with the most complex needs either. Um, we're also um, strategically trying to do some work across the CCG to think about what it means to have an, have an education, health and care plan up to 0 to 25 and why our services sort of stop at 18 and certainly there can be some issues with health funding from the CCG and we're looking at that at the moment certainly because it's a really vulnerable time for young people and we acknowledge there needs to be some gradation so there's not that sort of immediate stop but you know we tailor things off um, and it's sort of more planned and we support people through that vulnerable time. Um, I think um, there's lots of opportunities now where North Central London CCG, when we started working on this strategy, we were very much Haringey CCG. And there's um, opportunities to understand resources, approaches, what the prevalence is across the patch. I think there's work we could do um, definitely around diagnostic services, but also on other um, needs such as uh, respite needs sort of um, step up and step down so what I mean by that if someone with autism um, has 
some <coughs> health challenges, um, you know, we, we can offer them some support locally in a, and keep them local without them having to, to move out of borough. And what we found is certainly for children and young people, there has been an increasing tendency to find specialist placements and we can't keep them local to Haringey. We can't even keep them local to London. So there does need to be some thinking strategically about how we can try and keep our children and young people much closer to, to home. And so that's definitely an opportunity. Um, there's also um, links with the programmes happening around um, alternative provision, work on exclusions, because this cohort of children are um, very vulnerable uh, to being excluded. Um, and definitely in the young people at risk strategy because um, they are more likely to become involved in s serious youth violence and we see sort of exploitation with some of our complex care panels for children and young people with autism. Thank you. So, hello. Um, so in, in terms of the um, strategy, we just wanted to um, draw out again, it, it, is, it is a big strategy, it's very ambitious in scope and in order to make it manageable we've got it, um, the plan is to have the overarching plan and strategy which we're signing off today but there would be, um, we'll be tackling three priorities at a time in three year blocks. So what we can see here is nine key areas that the strategy covers. And there's a number of cross-cutting themes, particularly workforce development and training needs are really high across the system. There's sort of um, difficulty in recruitment and COVID has impacted and um, made that much more tricky um, and it was already an issue before. Um, we've been really trying to focus on becoming more reactive. Um, um, sorry, no. I'll turn that around again. We are very reactive as a system to managing need and we need to become more proactive, identifying people earlier. And we have some quite good ways across the system of doing that um, in individual agencies, especially. But we don't always come together and triangulate the information that we need. So I think that's a really important part of, of this strategy. And I've already talked about transition pathways and handover points. And that isn't, doesn't just apply at 18 also applies um, for children um, transitioning from primary to secondary school and I know there's been quite a lot of work done around that over time to try and, and support that um, uh, pathway and also um, also really importantly for tier four so those in an inpatient mental health unit when they need to come back into the community that's a very vulnerable time um, and we need to sort of support that and have services in place that meet those needs. So um, what we're signing off today is this overarching strategy. Schedule one in particular is under development. The aim is to sort of get that um, finished by um, end of November time. And that will be particularly focused on diagnostic services for autistic children, young people and adults. There's quite a lot of work underway across North Central London. And there's some real challenges there, but there has been some dedicated work some funding has become available to try and support some of that and um, a really good example of that is we've got um, some non-recurrent short-term funding to really focus on children and young people who are looked after or in care and those who are known to our child and adolescent mental health services because those are the most vulnerable and likely to need to be prioritised um, and we're also focused on that care and support and wrap around um, not just diagnosis, but pre-diagnosis and post-diagnosis and the different types of offer. Sorry, I had to unshare myself because I was muted. Let me just reshare the screen. Apologies. There we are. Um, current slide. There we are. Apologies. So um, I wanted to just talk a bit about the co-production that it kind of underpins us, um, the strategy in terms of where we are, but also almost more importantly, the delivery of the strategy where, where we really, really want it to not just be co-designed, but to be co-produced with um, autistic residents and via voluntary and community sector. We really want it again to, to, be, um, to be kind of owned within the autism community. 
Um, the Joint Commissioning, Joint Commissioning, so Catherine and I and Haringey, have really spent about two years trying to build quite a broad alliance of stakeholders. We, we, it, it's taken quite a lot of time because we wanted to have a lot of representation from across, you know, across the kind of care, education, voluntary sector, community sector, health, you know, everybody to really be at the table and obviously autistic people and parent carers. Um, I think that we've probably identified in terms of developing the strategy, there's been a slight gap in terms of actually hearing from um, children and young people who are autistic themselves. Um, we've had people who've been there advocating for them, perhaps by proxy, but that's something that we would certainly want to be kind of taking forward in the delivery of, of, of the strategy through the schedules. Um, I'm going to give an example on the next slide in terms of some of the co-production that has happened. So alongside the delivery and um, the development of the strategy, we have also been developing services for autistic people. Recently, we've um, just opened the Chad Gordon Autism Campus in Tottenham. Um, it's two services there. One is a um, learning disability and autism day centre or day opportunity service, um, particularly for people who might have quite complex needs, might have behaviours that challenge or some sort of dysregulation. And the other one is um, an autism hub called Actually Haringey, which is more of an independent sort of early help type provision where people can go in and, 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 and receive support through peer support and, and that kind of advice. So these are the two services which are based there. So we wanted, first of all, to make sure that the service specifications were designed by autistic users. So the Actually Haringey, we went to Markfield, ALAG is an autism user group. We went to students and autistic students and parent carers involved. For the day opportunities, um, uh, one of our independent parent carer groups called the Severe and Complex Autism and Learning Disability Group, which is a, a group of parent carers, they uh, carried out a review of different day services across North Central London and made recommendations in a report, which we adopted into our, um, our, our service specification. They were involved in the procurement of the service. They decided the tender evaluation. They sat some um, Mary Lang had sat on the panel in terms of choosing our provider group. Um, we've had autistic people and parent carers who are very involved in designing the, the building, making sure it's autism informed in terms of the environment being really specific to the, to the needs of this of this um, cohort. Uh, autistic chair of the autism group and who's a local resident helped do the recruitment for actually Haringey. So we developed an accessible interview process, made sure that, you know, we developed the questions that were kind of right and, and, and were really uh, focused as an outcome of the of the interview to try and recruit people who had lived experience of autism. Um, we have written specification that has key performance indicators and monitoring and measurements of how the service is doing, which directly relate to whether the service is co-produced with autistic people. So, for instance, one of the outcomes is um, that there will be peer support um, delivered within the service and, and particularly thinking about pre or post diagnosis of autism that that will be a really strong peer support offer. Um, at the moment we're getting services are sort of setting up their user led governance and steering groups and we intend those to be very heavily led and steered by by their users and then we have plans for any income that, that is, is created maybe through hiring out the site to the local community that the users would be able to almost commission how how that's being reinvested into their services so that's kind of just a bit of an example of of a kind of model of co-production that we would like to see kind of throughout and maybe even get extending beyond that as well um Catherine yeah so in terms of our next step so we're here today to sign off the overarching strategy um, we hope to publish that then in October and we'll be finalizing schedule one which has got those detailed plans for that first block of three priorities in November. Um, and we started to deliver the improvements. So we're not, we basically, although the strategy is only um, just being signed off, a lot of this work has already begun. We're in um, a strong position um, to be able to take it forward. We've got a, um, a really positive and proactive autism strategic group, and there were plans to have some um, task and finish subgroups underneath that. That's really um, existing infrastructure to be able to deliver this really important work. And we propose um, coming back here at least on an annual basis to be able to um, so you can monitor our progress and provide that check and challenge. And we can talk to you about what we've um, been doing. And it's this work. I think it's important to note here will build on our send our special educational needs and disabilities partnership work. And that's building on some of um, the um, 
I, the, the things identified within our send um, self-evaluation and as a result of the inspection. So that's it. And um, yeah, we'd like to open it out to um, questions, please. And thanks very much for having us along. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Sharon? Um, it's really a comment, really. First of all, to say you know, how welcome it is to see this after all the work that has gone in. Um, and also to, you know, to pay tribute to autistic people themselves and the families of autistic people in the borough and beyond who put in huge amounts of work and indeed put, in, put, put us all under pressure to get to this point. Um, it's uh, particularly for, I think, families with um, autistic people with learning disabilities, so the pressures on their lives are absolutely huge, as we know, and uh, this means going out to meetings, turning up at events, um, year in and year out to actually uh, push us to, to this point. So I do think we ought to record our um, admiration for their, for their work and their bravery, really, in being so honest about what is needed here. Um, and a second, of course, you expect me to say it's a great example of what can be, do, can be done with co-production, really involving people in, in shaping the services. Um, and we would certainly from Health Watch and Public Voice, we'd like to see a lot more of this going forward. <laughs> um, and thirdly, um, I, I'm pleased that there was some mention in the report of the um, role of the criminal justice system in dealing with this. I mean, in, in another life, I did quite a lot of work um, on the um, interaction between police, court system, prison system with autistic people. And um, th this is really extremely important for them to work. There are untold numbers of autistic people who end up in prison and it's never realised that they are autistic and the way in which they are treated in police stations um, without any recognition of the vulnerabilities that they have um, can quite easily lead to wrongful con convictions and the, the sheer hell that autistic people experience in prison because of the nature of their condition is, is absolutely appalling. Um, to think what those people go through in a confined space without anyone understanding their condition. Uh, so but I think that although there's mention of, of that in, in this report, I think we do need to work on that and make sure that police officers particularly and magistrates are current police officers and magistrates are fully apprised of the um, circumstances and, and conditions that of autistic people um, and that that's it's no use having you need to make sure this is part of police training in particular and JP training in particular so that if people do end up being arrested and locked up there is some recognition they can quite easily be tripped into false confessions for example and when we read that um, a lot of I think black males are more more have a tendency towards autism in some cases than others it goes some way to explaining some of the injustices, I think, that you read about in, uh, in the uh, criminal justice system. So I think we need to strengthen that interface with um, the criminal justice system to really complete the package here. But, but well done. It is good to see this at last. Thanks, Sharon. I think, um, I think there are a lot of people in here who really agree with you that we'd like to see more along these lines in terms of co-production. Um, and I wonder if anyone just have a think while I take some more questions and comments around how we might strengthen that um, the that relationship, whether or not there's a role here for community safety partnership, whether or not where we could raise uh, let's take that forward because I think it's a very striking point that you're making. Peter wanted to come in and then I'll take that's a part of that. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I found reading the strategy really, really interesting. And I, I was glad that you highlighted um, um, how the difficulty in, uh, in getting an assessment and diagnosis. And I've experienced this as a GP, um, sometimes with people later in life mm. who perhaps have spent a lifetime struggling to mm. understand uh, why they have had such a difficult time. 
And, uh, and it's very difficult. I found it very difficult as a GP getting an assessment and diagnosis, both of autism and ADHD um, in the borough um, for these people. <clears throat> and it's been and when you finally do get it, it, it's sometimes incredibly helpful for people, um, almost like a retrofit so yeah. that they can understand and make better sense. And more importantly, perhaps their their family, their friends can understand, their employers can understand. Um, and I think this is really, really important. I think that's been, you know, possibly something we've seen over the past decade, at least, is a growing understanding about things, about the idea of a spectrum, yeah. about people sitting on a spectrum at different points, you know. And I, and I think one can be slightly cynical um, about the, the surge in people interested in, in having a diagnosis, but I've, I've witnessed it firsthand how it can be also amazingly instructive uh, and understanding for the person when they get that, uh, that understanding, that diagnosis and assessment. It's a really brief um, addition, just to echo um, Sharon's points, absolutely, across the board. I mean, it's a really, that was a comprehensive, it was a comprehensive presentation revealing the amount of work and depth that has gone into this. And like you say, a, 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 an example of, of what co-produced production can, can um, produce. Um, the, I mean, it's, it, it, something that Sharon said actually that made that sort of triggered is I've had quite a lot of co um, casework, well, a few a few bits of casework where there has been a child in school, secondary school generally, who has either been excluded, in fact, generally been excluded. That all three cases I can think of were excluded. Um, were ethnic minority children as well, and um, were had actually had a diagnosis in two of the cases, um, but were being excluded from school. And the sort of long letters from the parents just outlining a kind of complete ignorance of what, you know, the staff, that's not in a sense the staff's problem, it, it, they, they just did not know what was going on. And um, I just wondered in the work that you're doing, you know, how knowledge sharing, um, awareness raising in that school environment. So a little bit like what Sharon's saying in the in the um, in the education environment, how in, in, in terms of not mirroring what you're talking about in the criminal justice. Um, thanks, Mark. Really, really useful points. I don't know if Catherine or George want to come in on that, but my comment also is whether or not we could pick that up outside this meeting and just think of have that conversation in Britain. I think it's really important to us as we do see this these cases firsthand so then we can really work through what's going on. Yeah, I mean I I mean Catherine do 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 come in. Um actually I think Catherine might have had to leave um but but that's okay we can manage between between us. So first of all in terms of um can I take um the, the, the point about the diagnosis. So I think that that's something that we're really really aware of that um so this is the point that i think um dr christian raised that we're really aware that there is a poor pathway at the moment for autism and adhd diagnosis for adults and that's something that we north central london ccg is commissioning at the moment and hopes to have a new service in place it's called a neurodiverse diagnostic service um which will be for autism and adhd from october 22 um, and that's currently in development in terms of specification and will be delivered by um, Barnet and Southern Haringey um, Mental Health Trust. So at the moment, instead of people having to go to SLAM and wait for years, but I think as Catherine already said earlier, waiting for diagnose, you know, waiting for a diagnosis is a bit of an issue. But we would hope that the um, the new hub actually Haringey will provide again local peer support and a sort of pre-diagnostic support, which is really, really critical while people are maybe having to wait for, for that formal diagnosis. Um, but I couldn't agree more in terms of it's really helpful. I like that you've written, said about being instructive um, to people. It really is. And that's what we heard firsthand from, from all the different autistic people that we um, engaged with. I think Sharon's point around um, and 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 sorry and 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 and, and, and Mike, it's, is it Councillor Hakata? Sorry, I can't really see that yet. Um, in terms of um, the, the the children's um, the sort of children who've been excluded, particularly with their autistic, and maybe have some other um, kind of 
need I and mean, you know, I think Rick mentioned the BME I mean there is within the strategy kind of going back to those kind of key areas we know that community safety so picking up the criminal justice system is a huge area of itself and it's in there it's sort of priority seven there's another one there around education and employment and again that is in itself a huge area and I think at the moment whilst it sort of was kicked off by Catherine and I working within a joint health and social care commissioning team we're aware that this progresses over the life course of the 10-year strategy we will need to pull in people from other parts of the system you know people with completely different skill sets and um, we are not and you know probably would have read that those areas would be maybe slightly light as a lot of the people we were engaging with were coming from that health and social care and community background but we need to have the same level of stakeholder engagement and kind of real system change and reflection and you know it, it, this is some really deep work that needs to happen across the piece hence it's ambitious and scope so I think there is a priority point and apologies from not knowing off the top of my head that it is about schools and it, and it is as far as that it's that AP work I mean the alternative provision it's exclusion it's it's really looking at yeah that, that we really want to be as, as, as broad and holistic as possible around the experiences of, our, of autistic children young people and adults particularly when they're having outcomes which are disproportionate to the rest of the to the rest of the kind of community and society and their peers um so whether that's mental health or education or criminal justice so it is going to be that broad but we realize it's going to involve an awful lot of different people to kind of get get there thanks georgie and i think John, yeah just on that point around exclusion so we have a model for change which is a different approach to alternative provision and as part of that we've been building on in view of exclusions we've just carried out a deep dive into the set of exclusions which happened in the first term, so October 20, um, that term um, after the first lockdown um, is leave. And um, we're having a learning event with schools, picking up on all the signs that can be picked up on in relation to those children and people who point out that predominantly from black and white ethnic communities, a number of them have either a diagnosis which should not happen, which should not be excluded in the body HCP, for example, but um, diagnosed or, or non diagnosed. Uh, so, absolutely, that's a long piece of work that we're doing. We're looking at the nature of the environment in the environment and schools. We need schools to be more autism friendly as we need all our areas to be autism friendly lighting, noise. Um, Sensitive, sensitive, you know, how sensitive people are to different environments, how you wear name badges, all those sorts of things you just really need to build that greater awareness. So as, as Georgie said, it's not just one thing the system, it's about how we all the society respond. So I'm really keen that that's the community response is figured everywhere. Um, but, um, it's a very important about criminal justice and on schools we are doing quite a lot of significant amount of work which brings out some more from autism and ADHD as well. Right. So, thank you. That's really helpful. And I think so. We are committing to following the, this work and keeping up to date. And I think we've got a couple of items there that would be good to steer for when you return to talk about, along with everything else, of course. Um, and I'm conscious that we have another meeting item next. So, I'm going to say thank you very much to Georgie. And I'm going to ask us we are being asked to approve this. Strategy. So, um, are we all happy and we are approving? I'd like to add two minutes. So, Jonathan and Will have their hands raised. I just want to check. Oh, oh, apologies. I can't see. Uh, Jonathan and Will, apparently you have your hands raised and I can't see that here on my notes. Oh, apologies. You are on the big screen. Uh, Jonathan first. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so, uh, I, I first of all, you know, We've been a part of uh, the group sort of writing this and thank you for the engagement that you've had with uh, Whittington Health teams. And I think, you know, generally really, really supportive of this. And I think it is wide ranging and, and a good approach. I guess the only thing that to flag, and it's just another angle on what Peter was saying, is, you know, the, the, the problem that we all know exists in CYP in terms of the children's assessments and the backlog there. And I think there's a lot of, you know, mentioned in the report and it's uh, you know there are various actions I think the the concern we would just 
and then I think you would uh, echo this, is that th those actions, even the report in, in the report, probably won't deal with the whole problem, and and that you know there there is a a, a real gap in capacity there that that is, that is you know a fundamental difficulty, uh, and you know we we are limited for for the resources to be able to do, deal with that. So I guess it's just flag that you know it, it remain it, it, it's not going to be completely solved by by the strategy i think um uh, from certainly from from our end but overall that very supportive of of what you've written there it's good thank you will uh, all I wanted to say was a big thank, big thank you to everyone for putting it together. The two points I wanted to make was one was really relating to Jonathan's point around we're a really resource constrained system, aren't we? So where do you kind of focus efforts or energies? How do we attract more resource into it? That may not be possible. And then my second point is we talked about criminal justice. We've talked about exclusions and we're talking about a, a real wide range, a really large number of people and, and really good to talk about neurodiversity, inclusivity. So I suppose my point would be around how do we really focus on the early years and really identifying things early and making sure that, you know, primary schools, nurseries um, are catering for people all across that, you know, all across that spectrum of neuro neurodiversity, because then quite often the exclusions come when it is too late and the criminal justice is a bit late to, and much more expensive and difficult to intervene at that stage. It's a really good thank point, both of those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgie, and um, I know your parcel. Thanks to Catherine, who's had to leave. Um, and let's move on. Um, can we record our appreciation of autistic people and their families yes. in contributing to this work? It's really very important that people feel that their work is recognised. In our, in our own records. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon, for reminding me. Uh, absolutely, we should. I think we should acknowledge a huge effort and an effort in campaigning and bringing to our attention the issues that we've been talking about right now for many years and uh, battled for to have acknowledgement and also for services to be uh, more inclusive. And I think actually in celebrating the chat all opening. We, um, we see that that living effect contribute to people's hard work. So thank you very much, Sharon. You're quite right. Um, and I think we should always acknowledge the important role that people can play in making our services better. And, and more power to us to hopefully do more and the better across all the services, really. So thank you very much. And thanks to all those families. Um, I can see we all do you want to come in? I see you've got something on the chat. Just something on the chat. It's just a comment. Nothing for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's make that a, a formal acknowledgement in our minutes, please. Thank you. Um, and perhaps we would also share that with when I'm on the on the circuit and visiting various groups. I'll make sure that I share that with those groups that we formally acknowledge that in this space. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we're now going to move on to items. Apologies. I was completely just, my laptop completely collapsed about five minutes ago, and since then I've completely discombobulated, um, and now I couldn't see anyone's hands up, and I don't know what's going on. So apologies. Let's go back. We must formally approve this. So do we formally approve this strategy? and commit to receiving um, updates in future. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks, okay. Item 11. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Just double checking. Everyone. Yes. Uh, brilliant. So um, I wanted to provide the board with an update um, on where we are with our integrated care system development. Um, just checking, can you see my screen? Yes. Fine. Um, and, and just to um, just to do a bit of a connection, the conversation that we were just part of previously um, was all about integration, is all about the bringing together um, of our 
um, our, our processes around individuals who have combined health and social care needs. So I just want to, um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about, uh, sorry, I can hear lots of, um, oh, that's it. Um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about our, our structures, but at the heart of those structures that we are trying to develop across our system, both at borough level and at North Central London level, is this um, the same of integration at an individual level and um, at a uh, at broader levels at neighbourhood level at borough level and at system level, um, and that really is coming from a recognition that people's health is predominantly affected by their um, socio-economic um, circumstances, by their their work, their surrounding, their education and skills, their opportunities, their resources. Um, more than their access to health services whilst that is very important and what we're trying to do is to make shape our systems and our processes so that we are really able to um, connect and integrate that, those services whether it is for um, a person with autism who has interconnected health care um, education job opportunities all those sets of needs um, coalesced around the person, or whether it is, as the example sets out here, an older person living in Haringey, um, you want a, a, a plan that is developed with that person that different professionals are aware of, that person needs um, coordination, and you want your systems, your rapid response, your hospital, your discharge process, your long-term conditions, you want that all working together for the benefit of the person. And so what we're talking about here is how we set ourselves up as, as systems to get that. So between now and April 2022, we are going to have um, a considerable amount of focus on a range of different um, partnership mechanisms, which together are, are our integrated care system. So one of those is establishing an integrated care board. So that is the NHS statutory body that is going to take over the functions of the CCG. And so there is going to be a lot of work to be done before April 2022 um, around key appointments to that board, around readiness to operate, due diligence, TUPI, policies, constitution, etc. because that board has to be ready to take on the statutory functions of the CCG. There will also be an integrated care partnership um, and some um, engagement documentation, which is really a sort of um, a clarification around that integrated care partnership has just come out recently. So that partnership will be a statutory committee that is made up of councils and the NHS and potentially others in North Central London. Um, and so that's working again at that North Central London system level. Our borough partnerships, which is our borough level governance, um, which are designed to plan, enable and deliver integration um, in Haringey and provider collaboratives. So those are partnerships between providers, so both between trusts um, and across primary care within North Central London. Um, that really connect those different provider um, organisations around delivery. So there is a lot of um, both operational and also development work that has to happen both at place level and at system level. It's not going to finish in April. We are still going to be um, doing this, but obviously, particularly around the readiness of the integrated care board, um, there is a lot to be done before April. We we really want to do this um, in a way that is meaningful and that involves having the opportunity to think together about where it is that um, integration between health and care and other agencies are going to make the most difference for people, um, both at Haringey level and at NCL level, so that what we're doing is building structures that enable that to happen. To, to, to root it in what matters to people, we're going to need resident voices to really um, be at the heart of it throughout this um, process. Um, and, and in Haringey, we do already do quite a bit of this through our patient engagement network and through the forums that we that we already have. And there will be work on this at, at all levels. Um, and to advance this uh, on a Haringey level, there are a series of seminars that we're going to have um, 
as a health and wellbeing board that will let us um, take some more time to um, to think about this. We will also be bringing in some um, partners to support organisational development for borough partnerships around this. So they are likely to also play into that um, those development seminars that we that we've already set up. Um, this slide just sets out those um, core elements of our infrastructure and their responsibilities. So the integrated care partnership and the responsibility of that, which is our kind of statutory committee between councils and the NHS and, and probably others, will be responsible for developing the integrated care strategy for our um, system population. The integrated care boards will be a, a board to lead on integration within the NHS. The place-based partnership, um, we will have to decide on the functions and the decisions that are going to be made within place-based partnership. And we'll have to agree that as an integrated care system and with the integrated care board. And the provider collaboratives are likely to agree particular objectives and areas of work that they take away as part of the integrated care system, whether that are, that's a particular area that primary care is going to work on together. And we've seen a lot of that through COVID, through things like um, the COVID response service um, and, and really kind of primary care operating at scale. Um, and we're seeing it um, all the time now amongst um, providers um, Richard and Jonathan talked about um, mutual aid and it's really a continuation of that way of working. I wanted to just put in um, kind of hot off the press some of the key messages that are in the engagement document about integrated care partnerships that was um, published from the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, so the integrated care board is the way that we'll get collaboration within the NHS and at that interface between health and local government. But I just picked out um, a, a little sentence that kind of stuck out to me from the engagement, that, that it does also have this, this function of holding NHS bodies within the integrated care board area to account and making sure that the NHS is really a sort of effective and relevant partner. So it does have a particular set of responsibilities um, around NHS delivery. The, the integrated care partnership um, is expected to be very influential, a driving force that um, supports broad and inclusive integration um, and really sets out that strategic approach to make sure we get um, improvements in health and care and to work on those cross-cutting wider determinants um, of, of um, health and wellbeing. So that's going to be a forum for agreeing um, collective objectives for enabling place-based partnerships, so the borough work, um, to thrive and also working together in the way that, again, our, our public health departments or councils are already working together on a load of different um, programmes of, of work across North Central London, but it's an opportunity to scale that approach. What I think is quite interesting is that under the integrated care board, there, there will not be prescriptive guidance for the integrated care partnership. Um, so the only members specified for the, um, for the integrated care partnership is the NHS integrated care board and local authorities. It's also expected that health watches will be involved. Wider membership is expected to be locally determined. Um, and, and there is an expectation that there will be a high level of involvement from public health leaders, from social care, um, from community groups, but all of that is being left to ICS determination with a kind of um, recognition that there are lots of different ways of getting um, good involvement, it, it, that there won't be one single forum or, or board or committee, there, there are likely to be numerous other opportunities for that um, joint work. There's also um, a, a high level of permissiveness about whether there is a new strategy or whether the integrated care partnership strategy builds on existing health and wellbeing strategies. And um, so the steer is to develop from what works and build on existing local arrangements. Um, and there will be opportunities to talk. This is a lot of probably quite new information. It's only just come out. Um, there is a um, 
Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny um, Committee meeting in early October. And there were also partnership council meetings and discussions being set up with council leaders um, to take much of this forward. I'm not going to dwell very much on this slide um, because some of us have talked about it in different, in different meetings, but there is also guidance that's out on the development of our place-based partnership. So this is our borough partnership. Um, and highlighted in, in pink are the activities um, of our place-based partnership. So that health and care strategy at borough level, our service planning and delivery, population health management, really connecting um, in the community, promoting health and wellbeing and aligning our management support. And how we want to do that is again going to be um, something that we will have to work through both within Haringey and across the other boroughs um, with a range of different options being there on the table from us working together via a consultative forum that is that makes recommendations and um, seeks involvement through to um, you know really embedded joint provision through a lead provider model and various steps in between so though how we want to take this forward um, really does need to be developed from what we want to do. So over the next um, over the next few weeks and certainly the next few months, we are going to be developing some um, some some products within Haringey and across North Central London that um, identify what are the um, delivery priorities that we've got and what what's the infrastructure, the, the plumbing, what are the mechanisms that we need in order to deliver on those priorities. So for Haringey, they are very likely to be the priorities that we've talked about today. Um, and it will be our, our operational readiness, access, winter planning, COVID vaccination. It will also be inequalities and tackling racism. Um, and it will be really engaging with communities, really getting um, our communities involved and um, in, empowered with, with the resources to um, support their, their populations at that locality level. So those are likely to be the kinds of priorities we have and we will then think through what do we need in order to really um, work as quickly and effectively as possible with those priorities and then what's the governance that we think would best support it. Um, so that, um, that is just by way of an, an update to note and to kind of initiate a bit of a, a, of a conversation about it, but also to flag to the board that we will have um, a mechanism for future conversations about this um, as we go forward up to uh, and beyond April 2022. There was, there was a lot in there um, uh, and it's a lot to address and of course, we do have a seminar booked uh, for October, but I'd like to open it up to questions now, comments. I'll take out Carter first this time. Um, thank you for that. And um, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, you talked at the end about uh, the infrastructure to deliver on the priorities, and I think um, um, the priority that I guess I'm most interested in and the residents that I speak to will be most interested in is the engaging and empowering of communities. Um, and you did mention um, about uh, resident voices being at the heart of the process. Um, and I guess one point, I mean, I know that it is a process, it's actually a in process at the moment, but it'd be interested to know if you have had any feedback from residents on the process so far and the system that is being proposed and how much they understand it um, but then if i'm not mistaken this used to be that the integrated care systems were in their original form that called accountable accountable care organizations i think there is some way back i think they were given that name but the point is that accountability was the sort of key um, word there. And, you know, you did um, mention that in the sort of partnership board structure. And I just wondered, you know, I guess what I'm trying to get to is how can we ensure that that priority of engaging, empowering communities 
is at the heart of that accountability structure um, so that you know that that's a reality not just not just a tick box thanks that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point and absolutely I had written down engaging and empowering so thank you uh I take sharon i'll take your question as well and then well yeah i mean i think also, Carter, this is quite right, and this is going to be a real challenge to explain this uh, enormous change to local communities, in particular, people who are actively patients and service users who will start to see changes which they won't understand unless we do an awful lot of work between now and next April to try to explain that to them. Um, the likelihood is, I think, that we're going to have a transition period, quite a long period, where until, until the new arrangements proper are in place. So there, it's going to be quite difficult for people to follow what is going on. So we do need um, to pay special attention to the communications um, around this um, on all sides, I think. Um, Secondly, that there is a concern, if we went back to your very first slide when you were describing the plans for the membership of the NCL level board, you've got some ominous words um, where it says possibly other, other partners or other entities would be members of this board. And there, there is a suggestion that commercial entities or private companies could um, be active, presumably voting members of the integrated care system at sub-regional level. And I think um, there would be, I think I'd be right in saying some alarm if this was to be the case. Uh, people are very, very worried about the potential for private sector commercial interests um, having influence at that level, um, at, at that um, north central London level, that's where decisions will be made about spending very, very large amounts of money. And um, I think this is something that people will want to know whether that is going to be allowed. I know that advice on this is dripping out very slowly. And we don't know yet fully what the arrangements are going to be, uh, but I think it will be issue, an issue for local people in Harrogate that, that follow these things, if, if there are any plans for that at all. And um, that's what is, it's worth flagging that possibility. And the other question I think that maybe people want to know is what, what happens to the Health and Wellbeing Board? Do we, do, are we absorbed into the arrangement? And what, what's the plan here? How's the government's going to work? Does anyone have an answer to that? Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> yeah, episode, as always, and insightful. Um, and actually, in a way, I feel like there's a bridge there between the two of you, which is that I've had a lot of feedback from residents. So an answer to Councillor Carter's my a little bit of my own answer, I've had a lot of feedback from residents locally expressing precisely the concerns that you are around the presence of um, private companies on the board with voting rights. So, um, if Rachel, you want to come in and then we'll talk a little bit about the role of health and being board and Charlotte coming as well. Sarah, do you want to pick up on any of those any of those points? Just so I know they've been discussed at NCL level as well. Yeah, I'm happy to um, briefly and just um, just to cover some of those off. So I think, I think first of all, um, Sharon and, and, and the councillor, I think, I mean, first of all, they're, they're really important points and I think we would agree wholeheartedly. So for us, um, this is very, very much about the things that you raised. It is very much about how do we continue to develop our approach to particularly empowering communities. So not just engaging communities, but working really differently with people around their health and their care and their outcomes. And I think the NHS and local government have moved much, much closer together on that. Um, in recent times and the voluntary sector and, and organisations like Healthwatch are playing a, a crucial role in that and we've seen that throughout the vaccine programme, we see that in the work we were just talking about around things like autism and some of, some of our groups and communities that have uh, probably some of the, the worst outcomes at the moment and we really need to keep focusing on that and that 
that is really at the heart of this. I think for 10 years, we've talked about how integration will improve outcomes and experience, and that is still absolutely what this is about. So I, I want us to keep coming back to that point and challenging ourselves around it. Um, on accountability, I, that's also crucial as well. So we already, obviously, through kind of all of our local structures, so whether it's health and wellbeing, health scrutiny committee or structures in the NHS, we already have a kind of system of, of local accountability as well as accountability now across North Central London. I think what the next steps are about, particularly in terms of our borough partnerships, are about how we become more sort of mutually and collectively accountable for outcomes. So I think we've been quite good uh, to date as public services at being individually accountable um, and looking as well at sort of colleagues on the call from NHS trusts and primary care, we sort of each answer for ourselves. And, and this is very much more, I think, about how we become collectively accountable to residents and collectively accountable for delivering the priorities we've been setting ourselves. Um, to that end, I think the point about the resident voice and how we're sort of challenged by that is really important. I think what we'll find inevitably is that our borough partnerships are richer and more diverse as they are now than some of our kind of structures at an NCL level. And I think we need to continue to develop that in the borough partnerships. So throughout COVID, our kind of joint work with communities and the, the number of voluntary sector organisations that we're involved in has grown quite significantly. And, and we have to keep sort of broadening the net and also getting deeper and deeper insight into our communities. Um, we hear a lot and Will will be the expert on this here, but we hear a lot about population health as being a kind of key part of integrated care. And what we're really talking about there is joining up our data and our insights and our intelligence so that we have a much richer and deeper understanding of the communities that we're trying to serve in each of our boroughs. And that, again, has to kind of really sit at, at the heart of what we're trying to do. Um, to speak to the point, Sharon, about private companies, I mean, we absolutely hear concerns about that. The, the ICS in North Central London right now is a composition of our trusts, primary care, local government. It is very much got a strategy of bringing as much of our work as possible kind of in-house, if you like. So, you know, as much uh, as we can sort of in totality with the organisations that exist across the NHS and local government care for our residents. We do as much of that as possible um, within the boundaries of North Central London. And that includes addressing things like placements for people out of area, making sure that we've got kind of tailored provision for more specialist care where we need it. And that that sort of joint working, I suppose, between between partners helps us helps us do that as well. Um, and then finally, on the health and wellbeing board, I mean, I'll, I'll hand over to Councillor Dasnevs to pick that up, but there is nothing in the guidance that's been released that suggests we wouldn't keep having a health and wellbeing board. I think that's a crucial part um, of our local joint working and our local accountability. I think the question when it comes to uh, the guidance that's being released is about how our five health and wellbeing boards and our strategies kind of come together so we've got a really clear plan and a really clear set of priorities across North Central London. Um, and I've certainly, in, in the privileged role I have of kind of going around all five of our borough partnerships, there's massive commonality around agendas like autism and LD and inequalities where every borough wants to make progress on that. So I, I think it's more likely that the conversation will focus on where do we really need to kind of put some, some welly as a system into addressing outcomes that every one of our boroughs is flagging as critical. Thank you. Uh... Um, everybody who doesn't know here, uh, uh, I firmly believe that we have an important role, health and wellbeing board has an important role going forward. Um, and I'm not alone across NCL in terms of my equivalents in the other in other boroughs. And those are conversations that we're also having um, uh, uh, in our in our roles within our local authorities. Um, but uh, and I think these are also conversations that we'll pick up quite strongly those two themes at, at the coming seminar that we're going to have and just to discuss. And I think there needs to be some further discussion, I totally agree, around how those health and wellbeing boards across LCA, um, across NCL rather, then uh, come together, appreciate that. But locally, we also need to be very confident that the system that we have is accountable to residents and that they can understand. You're quite right, Sharon, this is very complex and we have had this very conversation, just the slides that we have here, this is, this is quite dense, there's a lot there, and it is quite complex. 
it is a big challenge. You're spot on to make sure that people understand and understand the implications, both intended and unintended. Uh, I think Charlotte, you want to come in. Yeah, that, thanks so much. And I suppose just picking up on point in the health and wellbeing board, absolutely, there's nothing that changes the statutory functions of the health and wellbeing board. There's no primary care legislation, no primary legislation that change that. I suppose what is changing is the world around it. So inevitably, we'll need to be very mindful of that. But I think it's the statutory functions remain the statutory functions of the board. I think, secondly, we do, there are, there are some opportunities here. There are clearly a number of constraints and threats, but I think um, what is set out in terms of the importance of place of BOA is really important to us, and we need to hold on to that for all the reasons we've also. Um, and I think those series of seminars which we're proposing, so hopefully you'll have received invitations for monthly seminars over the next six months, they're a real opportunity for us to tease out some of these questions and to come out with what works best based on priorities. Um, and then to share that and to be informed by what's happening at North Central London, but also to inform what happens at North Central London. Like, so I think we're proposing a sort of iterative way of working for those seminars that hopefully doesn't sort of try to just tick a box and say we've talked about governance therefore, more sort of can we understand what is it we want to achieve, what's the best form for that, how do we increase that? Um, so I think it's important that we really... And I'm asking that the board really sort of um, prioritise those seminars and really give them the time and space that they need. Um, and then I just think um, the other important function we've set up here is the, uh, the, the Community Health and Care Advisory Board, because I think that's a real helpful way to sort of begin that process of communication with the wider public in the borough. But it, it is challenging, there's a lot, in, you know, on that one slide, there's a lot of sort of um, words that mean a hundred different things to hundred different people. So I think we really need to really use that board way actively as part of these deliberations. Thank you. Sorry, what do you mean? Yeah, um, I think the, the idea of having these seminars is really a good idea. We need to take in what we can find or best practice anywhere else, uh, including in, in other countries, about how integrated care can work. Um, but I think there's probably a whole group of people that we doesn't look as though we're going to include in our discussions about the way forward, which is the very staff that are going to run the system. And some, of, I think some of the most innovative approaches that I've seen or read about do involve, very much involve working with the staff and ways in which changing the, the workforce can improve our services. So I think we need to think about how we can involve the staff, not just physicians, but care workers, um, nurses, and the whole range of others that are involved in our health and social care systems locally about what flexibility we might avail ourselves of to really improve this and make it a service which is uniquely valuable for our particular community. So I think I think we try to go ahead without involving the people that actually run the system, especially with all the pressures that are on them at the moment, we're probably going to um, fall over ourselves. So that, that's, that's my plea. And this is all about connecting health and social care up with the local economy and jobs and the rest of it. It's got to be holistic if it's going to work. I think, I think it's spot on, Karen. Thank you. Uh, I think those are really strong points. And I think absolutely must be on the agenda. And I think we also have to think about how we've got a, we've got a set of structures that are how we can co-produce with our community, how we can, how it can be a, a thing of that. And I think that's not easy because it is, um, it's, there's a lot of complexity in it. But I think we are going to need to put those things out quite right. And, and I think, but to, to Charlotte's point, I think having, having a process where we meet regularly and I would appeal to, I know that it's really hard, it's hard to find times in the diary, but it, that if we can be present, I think we'll be able to tackle those issues, but also over time, rather than, I don't think it's one, one session that's not going to do it, is it really? Um, I'm conscious. Rachel, apologies. 
No, I don't. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to keep us longer. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. And and we've got so much more. We could. We could. I mean, this is why we're having seminars because we could talk about this for a lot longer. And I'm grateful for everyone's contributions. Um, and I also think it's useful to think about what we might pair in advance of that seminar. So I. I'd encourage and invite you all, please email me or um, uh, and just think a little bit about what you feel might be useful and how we've set out a structure for running seminars, but how we, uh, what, what kinds of themes, we've laid out some of the themes here already, I think, but there'll be others, so please do get in touch and share those. Um, there's one last important thing on the agenda, which is just talking about future agenda items and meetings, uh, and we've got a list there, and I wanted to add some uh, both given some of the feedback at the community board and also just given what we talked about today. So I'd like to suggest if other members of the board are happy that we um, add on there uh, mental health, um, digital inclusion in health, perhaps. Um, uh, it came up at the community board, Long COVID and Mental Health Watch are doing a survey on behalf of NCL, so I think it'd be useful to discuss that. And perhaps also, I think the other thing that came up with the community board were is primary care and exactly access to primary care. So I think those things will feel like important topics um, if everyone else is happy with that, in addition to that list. And I know the team are working on a bit of a, a bit of schedule so we can plan out what the next few months the health and wellbeing board look like alongside RCS seminars as well. So um, please do get in touch if there are other things that we haven't managed to cover. Um, but if no one's got any burning issues or AOBs, I'm going to bring the meeting to a close. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.